So now that you've read the door, um, it's a pretty crazy story. Did you get what's happening or were you just like, I don't know? Um, well, it's one of those things I like to assign it because sometimes in class, I mean, you may get, whether it's stories or articles, things that you kind of look up and go, what does this mean and what do I do with this? Um, and one of the first things to do is kind of to figure out the context. When is this done? So this is E.B. White. Now, this is the guy who did Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little. So, you know, these children's books that, you know, we're familiar with the stories and they're clear and they're straightforward. And then he comes across with something like this, um, which is just like a whole passel of craziness. And what's going on? Well, what's going on is all this stuff. Right. It's the 1999. He goes to the 1939 World's Fair. So this is, you know, the late 30s, right at the 40s. Um, you know, war is around the corner in terms of World War II. Um, and so um, things are going on. The World's Fair was this like big thing. They would do World's Fair and it would have exhibits from all over and everything. And so this one's in New York and he goes to that and they've got the newest technologies and what's happening. And we've got plastics coming out. Before we'd had this Bakelite, which is like a hard plastic, but it's different than what we like see with hard plastic these days. Um, but plastics are coming out, and then we've got fiberglass, and then, you know, all these things that kind of are, they're man-made. Nylon um, comes out. So it's the first synthetic fabric, you know, that wasn't wool, wasn't cotton, wasn't made from something in nature. Um, we've got um, science. I mean, we've got Einstein. We've got, we're on the verge of the atomic bomb. There's the discovery of Pluto. So this, this planet that is is you know so far away um the rise of the automobiles of course they've been around for a while but this movement and I love this example from here's 1930 and here's 1939 we go from that kind of what we totally see is very early automobile to this sleeker thing that has these rounded corners things like that that we see more um the defibrillator in terms of medicine um, um radio becomes prolific so whereas it had been you know um newspapers and things like that all of a sudden we can get this news in in the telegraph things like that that get us news faster than we've ever had it before um it's a move from an agrarian society to this is called the age of the machine so we get of course with radios we get transistors which are still changing in, in, in an important part of our world um but we also develop factories, and so factory lines are going, so people are moving to the cities for jobs, and of course moving to the cities means more dense population, means more people coming in contact with each other, and so really this becomes, this becomes a time kind of known as the age of anxiety, and that's what, where, you know, White is writing, and so a lot of these things kind of come through when we take a look at his story. So I want to do it, just kind of break down, and try to go through it really quickly. Um, but just kind of some of the things that, if you're ever approached with something that you look at and you're like, "That's as crazy as E.B. White's The Door," then the first thing to say is, "When is this written, and what's going on, right? And how does it reflect the time?" And that's one thing that can really help you there. And then the next thing is to kind of break it down and say. Where are these things that, you know, reflect that? So he starts and everything he kept saying is something, in, isn't it? Everybody is always somewhere else. Um, maybe it was the city. And then he says, you know, he kept thinking of the names of the things. They were text and frequently coid, or they were frexed and oid, or duro and sand, or flex and duro, and glass but not quite glass. And that thing you touch, the surface, washable, crease resistant, was rubber only it wasn't quite rubber. The wall, um, which was glass, but turned out to be on, on, turned out on being approached, not a wall with something else. And so this first paragraph is all about these things are these things, but not these things. Okay, this is wood, but it's not wood. This is press wood. We look at things. I have a desk right here. I'm looking at it. It looks like wood, but it is not a solid piece of wood. This glass that we're looking at through nine times out of ten is a glass, is plastic, is fiberglass, is some sort of thing. We're used to that. Here's a world where when something looked like wood, it was wood. When something looked like glass, it was glass. And so all of a sudden, in this, you know, in, in this time, things are changing. They are literally not what they appear. 
this clear, not glass, acrylic, right? A product of that, so of plastics and things like that. So all of a sudden we see this man who's, or this narrator, we don't know, um, who's talking and saying, look, these things are this thing, but they're not this thing. So it centers us in this place where this is a narrator, a character who's totally, you know, in a place of confusion because he can't even trust his eyes. When he looks at things, they're really actually not what they seem to be, even though they look like it. Um, and then we get this whole thing about those rats, right? Now about those rats, he kept saying to himself, <coughs> he meant the rats the professor had div driven crazy. And this is a reference to um, Norman R.F. Mailer, who was um, a psychologist um, uh, um, who did studies, and I mean, he's really well known for a number of things, and he really kind of changed um, the idea of behavioralism, that we're kind of taught to behave, and we do that in those ways, to learning and um, psychoanalysis so that we have this subconscious. But anyway, the whole thing with the rats, and this was in Life magazine about this time, so White's going to the World's Fair where they're showing off science and all these kinds of crazy things. And then he reads this article about these rats, and, and, and um, Mayer would put them, they would use them a jumping stand, a device that requires the rats to jump from a small platform across a gap toward a goal area. The goal in area includes two doors with cardboard covers delayed to displaying different simple patterns. And so, like, there really were. There was one with a circle, and, and if they choose you know, one, then they'll get the food, and if they don't, they don't, and then after that, you get the food, get the food, and you don't. So really, you know, this whole thing, and this is probably something you picked up on, is that the kind of illusion here is that the rats in the maze, you know, also refer to the humans in the maze of society, and this jumble of everything that's happening in this science, this age of machines, where technology is taking over in a lot of ways. So then he goes on and, you know, he t talks about the rats and then he says he didn't know which door, wall, or opening in the house to jump at, to get through. Because one was an opening that wasn't a door, was a void or kid, or the other was a wall that wasn't an opening. So still, the sense of not knowing what things are. It looks like a door, but is it a door? And that's what the rats had, right? They had this, this is the symbol you usually get for food, and then they, it was changed on them. Um and he caught a glimpse of his eyes staring in, eyes staring into his eyes, and in them was an expression he had seen in the picture of the rats, weary after convulsions and frantic after racing around when they were willing and did not have in mind having anything done to him. And more and more he kept saying, I am confronted by a problem which is incapable of solution. And that was one of the things that Meyer did, which... You know, this is kind of disturbing to me, but, but I mean, it wasn't, like, invasive or anything, but, you know, presented these rats with this problem that didn't have a solution. So it wasn't like rats in a maze where they could figure it out, even if you changed the maze eventually. Just, there was no way to figure this out. So he was constantly frustrating them, and they ended up having seizures and things like that. And, and his claim was kind of, look, this is when we, as humans, are in this place that this will lead to neurosis and breakdowns and things like that. And, and we understand that to a large extent now. Um, but anyway, um, you know, White's really picking up on that and saying, look, we're faced with all this mechanism, all this stuff that we've never been faced with at this level before. Um, so he goes on and he says, um, talks about the the air not far from the mini piano which was made of the same material nail brushes are made of so again what had used to be like made of ebony or made of wood that was that was you know polished and varnished and all these things is now the same thing as a hairbrush so it's again another kind of plastic right and all of a sudden it's not just i look at a window and it's not glass it's plastic but also these other things that were traditional that aren't the same. So it's this constant sense of changing and shifting. Um, and he says, you know, he talks about they would always wait until you had learned to jump at the certain card, the one with the circle. Then they, you would change that on you. And as we go through, we look and we see he miss, mentions other ones. Like he says, first they would teach you the prayers and psalms. And so 
that would be representative of religion and faith. And that would be the right door, the one with the circle and the long, sweet words with the holy sound. So here he goes, you know, saying, look, you know, we, we rely on religion and that seems to be the answer. And then we jump and we jump. And one day you jumped and it didn't give way. So all you got was the bump on the nose and first the bewilderment, the first young bewilderment. Um, and then we get this kind of intrusion with this other person. Now, in the World's Fair, one of the things they had was this display of this house of the future, you know, this idea of, you know, what it's going to look like. And, of course, it was lots of plastics and things like that. And um, so, you know, part of this is kind of his his character going through this house in a way, too. Um, and then he talks about, you know, I don't know whether to tell her about the door they substituted or not, the one with the equation on it and the picture of the amoeba reproducing itself by division. So that's science, right? We've got chemistry. We've got um, on the verge of, of uh, you know, atomics, um, understanding the, uh, the neutron and, and, and Pluto and, I mean, all these discoveries in science, right? And so this becomes another thing we can choose to have faith in. Right, or the one with the photostatic copy of the check for thirty-two dollars and fifty cents. We can also have faith in money, right? We can jump at those things, but the jumping was so long ago. If only, if only when you put your foot forward to take a step, the ground wouldn't come up to meet your foot the way it does. The curb coming up to meet your foot, and so this house, as he goes through, and he's kind of making this this metaphor and this connection between these rats that are jumping in this scientific experiment and us as humans who are jumping in our grand scientific experiment of our life. Um, but this house becomes that metaphor for it. And that house had, you know, things like some escalators or moving parts, things like that, that became that what you really don't have in a house. Um, and then he says, you know, he goes on, it's inevitable they will keep changing the doors because it is what they are for. And the thing is to get used to it and not let it unsettle the mind. But that would mean not jumping. And you can't. Nobody can not jump. There will be no not jumping. Every day for you go through life, we're still jumping, right? That is the nature of life, to continue to jump at something, whether it is school, whether it's the job, whether it's whatever it is, right? The partner, the love, the kids, the family, the car. We are jumping at something, right? It is that thing we look to as a reward, that thing we work toward. Um, and so he says, among rats, perhaps, but among people, never getting no notifications. Sorry about that. Among people, never. Um, everybody has to keep jumping at the door, the one with the circle on it, because that is the way everybody is, especially some people. You wouldn't want me standing here to tell you, would you, about my po friend, the poet deceased, who said, my heart has followed all my days something I cannot name. It had a circle on it, and like many poets, although few so beloved, he is gone. It killed him, the jumping. So, you know, I mean, this is, in, on one way, it's, it's rather sad, but this is also a time when, in terms of, you know, what's happening because of those changes, and because of changes in mental health care, too. I mean, earlier in, in the 1800s, definitely, and even into the 20s, I mean, mental health care and mental institutions were atrocious. You'd rather be in jail any day of your life. Um, you know, many people were chained to, you know, or, or handcuffed, to, tied to beds and just left there. And, um, you know, maybe they'd be bathed, maybe the sheets would be changed on some sort of regular schedule. I mean, there was just, there was no understanding, there was so little understanding of, of mental health and mental health care that madness was just seen as this thing that they're just weren't treatments for it. And so um, when we think about depression and suicide and those kinds of things, um, and in this changing world, there's so much kind of upsetting of people. Um, we see changes and we go with the flow because in a lot of ways we're used to it. But this is a place where, you know, for the longest time in history, we see history things not changing a long time. I mean, you look at the 1930s, those pictures there, you will see that car one to the other changes but it's still a car. But still, you look at something like the cart, the horse and cart, look at how long that's been the way it was for hundreds of years, and then there'd be some innovation, you know, a wheel with a spoke or, or things like that that came along 
gaps of 100 years in terms of really widespread technological changes. So the last century, the 1900s, becomes this century where change started to go fast. And this is the nature of technology, right? Change happens, and technology grows, and then it builds on itself, and it starts changing even faster and faster. Um, and so one of the things that does, too, is, is this kind of displacement of the world does result in the world going faster, moving faster, changing faster, does result in a lot of, of kind of, you know, um, mental health issues, whether it's, it's anxiety. Um, it is called the anxiety. Um, so, you know, in, in this sense, he's referring to that. And then he talks about the door with the picture of the girl on it. This is love. If only... If, um, on it, only it was spring, her arms outstretched in loveliness, her dress, it, it was the one with the circle on it uncaught, beginning the slow, clear, blinding cascade, and I guess we would all like to try that door again, for it seemed like the way, and for a while it was the way, and the door would open, and you would go through, winged and exalted, like any rat, and the food would be there, the way the professor arranged it, everything was okay, and you'd chosen the right door, for the world was young. The time they changed that door on me, my nose bled for a hundred hours. How do you like that, madame? So this idea of love, right? We jump and we jump and we jump and we get hurt. And I'm a big believer in, I'm not sure whether it was Shakespeare or some other fine author, who said, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved again." And that's what White's echoing there, right? That even when we get hurt, we get back up and we jump again. We try again. Um, and so, you know, this kind of idea of lost love, too. And so all of these these doors start representing those things that we are seeking. And so, you know, these things we are seeking in this world where technology is new and bright and shiny and so different from what we've had before um, becomes this thing that can distract us, that can pull us away, that can make us crazy in all of these ways. Um, but still... These certain things are always there. Um, and he says, For although my heart has followed all of my days something I cannot name, I am tired of jumping and do not which way know which way to go. And so it is this admission of, you know, realizing maybe I don't want to jump at all the things. Um, this kind of how can you not jump, but do I have to jump? And I think, you know, when we look at what's happening here in White's world, in the door, this kind of metaphor of the rats and the jumping, and we look at ourselves, I mean, times haven't changed that much. We are still human. And we could be talking about this with, instead of the advent of, you know, I mean, whatever it is, we could talk about it with the advent of the, the cart and buggy, right? That people aren't going to ride just the horse, or people are going to, I mean, people have been griping about technology changing, and it's going to ruin the world forever, really. Um, but we do deal with it, right? We have to take it in and deal with it. Um, and he keeps bringing up this thing my heart has followed all the days, and I can't name, right? This longing that I have that is unnamed, unrecognized. Um, and it says, what are you following these days, old friend, after your recovery from the last bump? What is the name? Or is it something you cannot name? And he almost asks us directly, you know, this narrator almost asks us through these pages, what are we jumping at? Um, and he says, you know, the rats for it have a name for it. I call it, and it comes in sheets, something like insulating board, unattainable and ugly proof. So again, he goes back to this kind of, you know, this kind of pseudo thing that we make up what it is we're jumping for. Um, and then... And then we get to this, this man out in New Jersey of his terrible necessity and the passion trouble he'd gone to all the years with the householder's detail, building the estate, planting the trees, the lawn, the bulbs and everything. And then almost without warning, he would be jumping at the same door. It would give, oh, it talks about how, you know, he had done all of these things and we're working toward this kind of idea of him, you know, letting go of those. And one of the things that happens in 1938, we get the 40 hour work week. Um, but also, um, oh, let, let me go back here. Also in suburbia, this idea of, you know, this building of kind of suburban homes and um, the um, FHA, Federal Housing Administration, is set up, you know, this is post the early 30s, of course, with the Depression, and so this is coming out of that. Um, so set up these housing administrations, so it's, and then they started building house because 
there was this lack of affordable housing. Um, and so um, there were kind of these guidelines for houses. And this leads to the idea of suburbia, of, you know, not having that through street. You know, when you turn off in a neighborhood and then you're like, oh, I thought this was going to go straight and it's a, a crescent or something like that. You know, that's to cut down on traffic, you know, blasting through, things like that. Um, but these houses that also look very similar and they're prefab and you can order this house out of the Sears catalog and they'll bring it to you and you put it together. And, and so it is a lot of that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, he also talks about this idea of this guy out there that we get through here and there throughout this story who has this house and then he's tearing it down. Again, another kind of anxiety of everything you've built up and then just taking it apart because of that heightened anxiety about it. Um, and then it was impossible to say, maybe it was the city that made him feel the way he, he did. I'm not the only one either, he kept thinking. Ask any doctor if I am. The doctors, they know how many there are, and they even know where the trouble is. They don't like to, t only they don't tell you about the prefrontal lobe, because that means making a hole in your skull and removing the work of centuries, so, um, so many, many years. It only means a whip of ether and a few death strokes, and the higher animal becomes a little easier in his mind and more like the lower one. Um, and so, what happens is about this time, too, like I said, mental health care is just despicable. And um, so the lobotomy comes into favor. And it really was taking early lobotomies, actually used an ice pick going through the eyelid and then banging it up there. And it would kind of separate this kind of prefrontal lobe. And, um, you know, it's... Um, it, it was it was really really I mean for some people it was a miracle but at the same time it's really removing a lot of people's personality um, and but I mean it was actually an outpatient procedure you go into the doctor's office get your lobotomy come out um, but you know this is a great question from and there's a wonderful um, um, documentary on this by PBS called the lobotomist it's about the doctor who really in the U.S. advocated this a lot and. Um, one of the questions says, at what point do in interventions me meant to alleviate suffering begin to conflict with essential human qualities? And that was really what it came down to. Because, you know, when you're not yourself, yeah, you may be well, you may not be suffering from neurosis or anxiety or depression, but at what point are you not you? You know, and so that becomes one of the questions, and that's one of the debates, too. So whether it's medical, you know, I mean, in terms of um, pharmaceutical, or it's like physical, where it's uh, this lobotomy, um, those things are, are starting to come into play. So we're starting to get some mental health care, and this is good, but as we know in almost all of our early medicine, there are just some horrifying things there, too. And so this is another one of them that White's really talking about. Um, and then we go through and it says, you know, he crossed the carpet and everything beyond he, he half expected to find one of the old doors he had known, perhaps the one with the circle, the one with the girl, her arms outstretched, but he saw instead a moving stairway. He stepped off and the ground came slightly up to meet his feet. And so here we are at the 1939 World's Fair and this is the Hall of Power, and there's a, there's moving stairs going up to it. So, um, again, that kind of idea of that movement in those ways. Um, so, you know, does that answer all your questions? Probably not. Um, but um, does it put it in perspective? You know, when you're faced with something that you're like, what the heck is going on here? Stop and look at the time. Stop and look at the author. I mean, with White, just to look at who he is doesn't give us a whole lot of things besides questions. Because it's like this guy wrote Charlotte Web, Charlotte's Web. This guy wrote Stuart Little. I mean, many of these childhood favorites. Um, but if we look at the historical time, you know, what was happening then and, you know, how many things were going on, this age of anxiety. I think in a lot of ways, you know, we look at writings today, and, and I mean, it's it's always, as humans, we are in constant flux. Things are changing. But, you know, over the last century, and as we move into this new century, things are changing even faster, but they still stay the same. Got a new phone. The other day, mine was dying. I hated to buy a new one, but, you know, it's, it's a smartphone. And... <laughs> set it up and everything and I'm like I'm kind of looking around and, think, and I remember the first smartphone I had 
oh my gosh, that was really cool. Like for hours, you know, just like this new stuff. And this one, I'm like, well, yeah, it's kind of like the other phone. It works and still got the same apps and this and that. So, I mean, yeah, there's some new bells and whistles on every new one, but there's still a smartphone. You put a housewife from the 1950s into our, one of our kitchens. It's still pretty much the same. So it just stays the same and it changes at the same time. Um, and so White's really writing about the anxiety of dealing with change, but at the same time, we really see that that was 1939, this is 2019, so 80 years ago, and we see that in a lot of ways he's, he's also writing about humanity, right? How we always jump at things no matter what they are, whether it's just the circle or it's, you know, whatever it is on that door. Um, and then we always struggle with those things. So how do you make sense out of it? Sometimes you have to go and do that research you've already learned how to do and say, what is the context for this? What's happening? And then you have to do those logical jumps we're learning to do with writing about film and writing about stories, which is doing that deeper thinking and saying, okay, what could this mean, right? Where is that metaphor? Where is that connection? What is this like? Um, and that's that's the kind of thinking you do both ways, both in terms of kind of research and thinking about what's behind it, but then also thinking about, you know, what does it mean in terms of being human or this moment in this place. So I hope that clears up some of the door. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it on some abstract level. Um, I think his voice is quite poetic. Um, if you read it with that kind of almost poetry, sing-songing thing, um, there's a great deal of beauty in it. Um, and if you were just like crazy, I never want to read this again, well, hey, you know, you did it once, so there you go. Um, anyway, so um, enough of that. Um, take care. Let me know if you have thoughts and questions.